Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about one of the serious masterpieces by an American original. I'm speaking of Alan Hovannis. Now, Hovannis is something that is somewhat of a controversial figure in American music because he was unbelievably prolific. He wrote over 500 works. He lived from 1911 to 2000. And although he was born in Massachusetts, he's a New Englander, his actual style is much closer to the West Coast school of people like, for example, Lou Harrison, in that it was heavily influenced by Eastern thought, Eastern mysticism, and Eastern music, particularly that of Japan and Korea, which he studied quite intensively. He wrote something like 67 symphonies, at least. There are some more probably sitting around in manuscript, we hear. And his style was, I think, a little bit more varied than people think it was, because he's only known, like so many prolific composers, by one piece. And that piece is his second symphony, subtitled Mysterious Mountain. Now, most of his symphonies are programmatic. Most of them deal with spiritual or, or pantheistic natural topics of some kind. Mountains always figure prominently. And number two, Mysterious Mountain was recorded by Fritz Reiner, which gave it an instant uh, 15 minutes of fame. And it's still his most frequently recorded work. It's a gorgeous piece in three movements. And it's kind of like the American equivalent of the Talus Fantasia. That is a piece of great beauty. It has a timeless quality because of the use of modal harmony. It's, it's really lovely, but I'm not talking about symphony number no. two. That could be the subject of something else because I don't actually think it's most representative of the various elements of Hovannis's style, which is what I'd like to get to. Some of the pieces he did, I mean, I had the great pleasure of playing a couple of concerts of his music. I was the special guest tam-tamist because Havanas was a big tam-tam guy at a vocal recital that had an actual song for voice in tam-tam, which was really kind of cool. And then I was fortunate enough to play with the Manhattan Chamber Orchestra under Richard Alden Clark in his Symphony of Metal Instruments, which is really cool. It's based on Korean uh, Korean folk music or Korean art music or some sort of Korean music. And it's written for something like six flutes and a bunch of trombones and a raft of percussion. And once again, I was the Tam Tamist and this was recorded on Koch or Koch if you're German. Um, here it is. It's very out of print, unfortunately. It's called the Symphony of Metal Instruments on the cover and the Symphony for Metal Orchestra on the back. I'm not sure which is correct. Also, Symphony number 17 out of 60 some odd. And uh, I can't, I don't have permission to play you a sample of it, but I can give you a sample of my solo. Here it is. There you go. It's an excerpt, a perfectly straight excerpt from Havanis's Symphony of Metal Instruments. Anyway, this was not the tam tam I used on the recording. I used a tiny little about an inch or two smaller than this because it was it was so vibrant that uh, it was it was overloading the recording instruments, and so we had to tamp it down a little bit. But it's a wonderful performance, I must say. And uh, not because of me, because of everybody else. And it's really, really a cool piece. Anyway, it, the piece that I want to talk about, however, is on Crystal Records. Here it is, Crystal Records. I have permission to use some samples, so thank you, Crystal. And I'm talking about his tone poem, Fra Angelico. Now, uh, this is the piece that got me into Hovannis. You know, there's a, you know, like many composers who were incredibly prolific, his style did not exactly evolve. He, he destroyed a lot of his early music. And once he, he hit on what he wanted to do, that's what he did <laughs> for most of his life. So there's a certain similarity in what he did. And, uh, but it doesn't mean everything he did sounds the same. But his music does employ certain elements that recur quite frequently. One of them is, as I mentioned, modal harmony. 
Another of those elements is a frequent recourse to polyphony. He was a wonderful contrapuntist. He wrote lots of very beautiful fugues and canons and that kind of thing. And then also there are really sort of modern techniques that he employed aleatoric music, you know, where everybody has a, a passage in free rhythm that they play essentially at random and make a, a glorious hubbub. And these sort of percussion waterfalls that employ that technique that are quite marvelous. And, it, you know, so so depending on on what he's illustrating, he will employ some or all of these different techniques. Some of his music is quite dissonant. It isn't all just just sweet and luscious, although a lot of it really is. Much of it has a definite Eastern quality to it, something of a sometimes Hollywood-esque uh, biblical epic type modality. Uh, we'll hear a little bit of that as well. And it's really marvelous. But Fry Angelico is, is such a typical combination of all of these various elements. And I'm going to play you some samples so you'll hear. Now, Fry Angelico, in case you don't know, was a monk and one of the great artists of the early Renaissance. He lived until about 1455 from like the 13... 90s to 1455 or so. Um, he's most famous for doing frescoes in his monkery or wherever the monks live, your friary or you know monkatorium or whatever they call it, and uh, in Florence. And all of his art was religious in nature, religious inspired. Um, I have here, that courtesy of Wikipedia, um, a, a sample, an enunciation scene, which I uh, put up here. And I think you can see uh, that Fra Angelico, Fra Angelico's works are very, very beautiful. They have something of, you know, the medieval mysticism to them, but also that Renaissance clarity and proportion and, and elegance and wonderful three-dimensionality and vividness. And I think that this particular example of his art is entirely typical and also quite typical of Hovannes's work and his illustration when Hovannes is really at his best. And, you know, as with all of these incredibly prolific composers, you have to kind of dig around to find the best stuff. But if you like his basic style, then you're going to enjoy most of what he wrote. The thing is to try and find those pieces that have the most vivid and, I think, effective and balanced combination of the different elements that go into his mature style. And Fra Angelico is certainly one of those. This is a recording with the Royal Philharmonic that's actually conducted by Hovannis himself. It originally appeared on Poseidon Records, which I think was somehow related to Hovannis. That's mostly what they did. And I remember them vividly. They were grotty pressings of cheap vinyl. I mean, it was hard to get one that sounded well. Happily, um, when Crystal took over their catalog um, in the 1980s, they, they remastered everything. And it, this has been beautifully beautifully re-recorded digitally, and, and so you're, we're fine in terms of sonics and production values. It's absolutely first class, and this particular disc comes with some other pieces. The the Symphony Number no. 21, which is subtitled Symphony, uh, oh my god, Symphony Etchmyadzin, 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 Etchmyadzin is the religious capital of Armenia because Hovannis was Armenian and got heavily in touch with his Armenian roots while studying the music of Japan and Korea and the Far East. So as you can see, there's a rather rather unique mixture of elements in his music, and that's what makes it special, quite frankly. Um, and then there's the Armenian Rhapsody Number no. 3 and his chamber symphony, which is marvelous, called Mountains and Rivers Without End. That scored for a 10-person chamber ensemble, but a wonder, wonderful one. It's flute, oboe, clarinet, trumpet, trombone, harp, timpani, and three percussionists. And what's not to love there? And finally, Fra Angelico. Now, Fra Angelico essentially is a piece about a hymn tune, um, and that hymn tune gradually emerges from a welter of other sounds. And you can hear right at the start his love of counterpoint, but it's counterpoint that's very, very special to him. The bits of the hymn tune are played right at the opening by three solo violins 
in a in a strict canon, a wonderful three part canon that's incredibly mysterious and evocative. And here's a little bit of that, just so you get a sense of it. Here it is. Now, as the work proceeds, that hymn is going to grow more and more prominent, interspersed with episodes of other kinds of music and a soft refrain featuring dissonant string chords. And that's basically all it is. Hovhannes's music is not sonata music. It doesn't have a goal-oriented tonal direction. It's much more in the like modern type of composers like, you know, Messian and those guys. It occurs in blocks or, or you know who, Bruckner, you know what I mean? It's that kind of music. It happens in blocks and it's quite static in its general impression. Very, very beautiful, but more monumental than motive. So along the, line, the way for this hymn finding its ultimate fulfillment, before subsiding into the mysterious opening with which the piece began, it encounters stuff. Some of that stuff is a wonderful passage where all the strings play a little fragment of melody in, in four zillion parts. They all do it at their own pace and their own rhythm. I mean, not their own rhythm, but their own tempo and, you know, their own entries and with trombone glissandi and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And there are a couple of those wonderful percussion waterfalls with with crescendos on the tam-tam. There's some, one of those in the Symphony for Metal Orchestra too. It's great. And here it is, just so you get a sense of what it sounds like. And then finally, when there have been enough interruptions for all kinds of evocative music along the way, interspersed with gradually growing and more confident statements of the hymn tune, the tune appears once in all of its majesty, announced on the brass um, and accompanied with by simple chords in the strings. And, you know, some people find this kind of style by Hovhannis rather, rather tacky. And it can sound that way, I, I freely admit it, but I, I, I think there's an innocence and a simplicity to it that's very affecting. If you forget those Hollywood Bible picks for a minute and some of the other sort of cheesy, cheesy faux Eastern music. I mean, Hovannis knew the real thing after all. Uh, he really did. And, and I think that the way he presents this music is majestic and sincere and grand, exactly as he intended. You have to just let it be itself and, and banish your preconceptions. And I think you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Here is the statement, the opening anyway, it goes on for a while, the statement of the hymn and its climactic appearance.
And that climactic statement ends with a fabulous whack on Mr. Tam Tam here. And it's just, it's just terrific. But I remember the first time I heard this, I, you know, I, I was listening to it, it was on the radio. And I was just driving along and I thought, wow, that's really special. That is really cool. And after that, I was just hooked, hooked on Hovannis. He's really a wonderful original voice among 20th century American composers. And he tends to get denigrated because of, like I said, because he was so prolific, because his style was so hermetic. And it was, it consisted of those elements, some of which I've just played you, arranged in different ways and called different things. There is a Mount St. Helens symphony with a volcanic eruption that's on Naxos. And I hope in these, in these chats that I'll have the opportunity to periodically dip into Hovannis and present different works to you. And you can get to hear what his range was within his, his chosen Fach. I have a lot of admiration for composers who knew what they can do, what they could do well, and just went and did it. And Hovannis was one of those. He never tried to be something that he wasn't. His music is completely honest, completely of his own and personal to him. And you either like it or you don't. <laughs> it's that simple. I like it. I think you will too. And as I said, this recording is on Crystal Records. Um, I give the website in the, uh, in the, in the, a little description of this video down below if you want to order it directly because you can you can get everything directly from crystal it's available and that's one of the reasons i wanted to highlight this recording because these pieces tend to come and go contemporary music always comes and goes but a composer like Havana's particularly um, he has his fans he has his admirers and he had sort of a renewed bit of fame thanks to the seattle symphony under Gerard Schwartz, who did a whole bunch of Havana's recordings that are quite splendid. They were originally on Delos. They were taken over by Naxos, and they're excellent. And then and then Koch, or Koch, if, however you want to describe it, also did a few recordings, and, and Crystal Records has an excellent Havana's discography uh, that's worth exploring. So that's basically all you need to know. I, you just turn yourself loose. If you like what you heard, you're going to like just about everything Hovannis wrote. It's that simple. So keep on listening, folks. Go get some Hovannis. Have a good time. Take care. <laughs>